The video I'm about to make today is so important. It gets a little messy. Now, how far would you go to look beautiful? People need to be educated more. Global crisis. I don't know. I feel like this video is very important. Everybody just wants the nicest, newest thing. It's incredible what these people would do to make easy money. After digging into all this research, this could be the reason why product reviews are inconsistent. The dangers. Connect the dots. There's something wrong with it's like that. Nobody can do that. Realizing that something had gone terribly wrong. The video I'm about to make today is so important <laughs> that I have been brainstorming and researching and looking into this for literally a year and some change. The research is just never ending. After digging into all this research, this could be the reason why product reviews are inconsistent. It could be one of the reasons why people who get PR in the mail get better results than people who may get things in stores. I don't know. I feel like this video is very important. And so I wanted to do it justice, but I realized that perfectionism has gotten me nowhere but in my brain. So I was like, I have to go on camera and just put this video down for y'all. And if I need to add to it or change anything, bear with me. This video today is not to scare anybody. This video is not to deter anybody. This video is to ensure that y'all get what y'all spend your money on when you go buy products and nothing less than exactly what you pay for. I want to take it back to where this video all started and what started this entire process and that is this little bottle right here. Now y'all might be thinking, Bri, I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with wigs, then you know that this is a hair glue. Some people might be like, so Bree's saying hair glue is, is dangerous, okay. No, that's not what I'm saying right now. Slow your roll. I got this hair glue and it was literally one of the best hair glues I'd ever used except for one condition. It made my forehead break out. And I was like, yo. All right, this is it, people. Let's go, let's go, 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 go. Of course, I love research, so I dove into my research. I was like, is it the technique I'm using? Is it the way I'm preparing my hair, the application, the formula, or, or am I allergic to something? But I noticed that that wouldn't happen for a few days. Other than that, it was almost the perfect glue. So I realized, okay, even though there are some people that can wear wigs for extended periods of time and have them like, you know, all the pull tests and have them not moving and stuff, I was like, okay, I just have to come to the reality that if I wanna use my favorite glue, then I cannot wear wigs a week two weeks on end anyway. But then <sighs> I realized something. What I realized one day when I was casually scrolling across the internet, a video came into my recommended feed on YouTube and it was actually this video right here. Now, naturally that video sparked my curiosity as this was the glue that I had been using that I loved and I tried several and it was the Bold Hold Active Hair Glue. So I went ahead and clicked the video and the owner of Bold Hold did an entire comprehensive video about her issue with fake products entering the marketplace and what she was doing to combat fake products. This is where things got interesting. There was one thing that the owner said specifically that stood out to me on a lot of their new bottles and the bottles that they've been putting out for some time, there was going to be a very specific detail that marked a real product versus a fake. It's an engraved B. I was like, okay, I love this glue, it works well, but what could it hurt to go look at my bottle? So I go under the counter to go look for my bottle, y'all, and I go and I flip it over, and there is no B at the bottom. Wait a damn minute. <laughs> And it was in that moment that I was shocked. I was shook because see, I'd gone to an established beauty supply store. I had paid the retail price for this product. And even the store, when I looked on the back end, was listed as a vendor for this product. So I was like, how is it possible? And I just stared at the bottle. Like I'm even staring at it now, realizing that something had gone terribly wrong. And this was a topic that needed to be spoken about. But this did happen at the height of the end of 2020 when there was a lot more going on than a potential counterfeit hair glue that I had found. So 
I decided, all right, I'm gonna tuck this away. But the thought just never left my head. From that day forward, I was like, you know what? I have to hold on to this. Most people might throw it away, but I had to hold on to this glue because I felt like it was the symbol of something that I wanted to speak about. I have been aware about counterfeit fashion for a long time. The knockoffs are getting better and better and more profitable for these counterfeiters. Also being born in New York where, you know, you can kind of walk down the street and see the blankets full of bags and things like that. That was nothing new to me. And I also knew a lot about counterfeit makeup industry specifically. Due to documentaries that it surfaced, etc. Counterfeits have tested positive for known carcinogens or serum super glue. But I hadn't quite seen anyone cover the idea of counterfeit hair care. That is what led me down the rabbit hole. I was surprised at all the things that I found. This one little bottle made me ask, how the hell did this happen? Despite in the recent years where there have been an immense amount of counterfeit makeup seizures, the industry continues to expand. As per the Organization for Economic Corporation and Development, the international counterfeit cosmetics trade has consistently risen since 2013 and was valued at approximately $5.4 billion as of 2016. The United States is the leading receiver in counterfeit products and accounts for almost 20% of the global seizures of counterfeit products. And as you've seen with even my story, the counterfeit cosmetics industry has caused a lot of harm to individuals, brands and companies, and governments. So where do we go from here? How did all of this begin? So the use of counterfeit cosmetics for customers can be extremely dangerous and even fatal. And it says here, investigations by the government have turned up fake cosmetics containing recognized carcinogens, including arsenic. Arsenic is a known carcinogen and has been linked to increased risk of bladder, lung, and skin cancers, skin discoloration, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. While the toxicity of beryllium is still being studied, the EPA has labeled it as a possible human carcinogen, with most of its detriment being done to the lungs and respiratory system. And cadmium, which is also known carcinogen that targets the body's cardiovascular, renal, gastrointestinal, neurological, reproductive, and respiratory systems as well as excessive quantities of hazardous heavy metals like lead and mercury. Between January 2018 and March of 2020, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration received approximately 12,000 reports of consumers alleging adverse effects due to these products. They've had cadmium, arsenic, lead, and cyanide inside makeup. Perfume has had horse urine in it. The impact on brand reputations. And as you can imagine, this is something I even thought about as someone that respects brands and the work that they put into formulating products. This industry of counterfeits does irreparable damage sometimes to the name of a brand and the reputation, and the brand often loses money. When a buyer doesn't know they've bought a knockoff and it falls apart, it's the real company that customer blames. It may later come out that a product is counterfeit. It will still deter the general market that may not do that further research to even buy the real product when they see it on shelves at an established retailer. So basically a lot that brands can lose from counterfeits. Beauty industry and the cosmetics industry is estimated and expected to lose 5.5 billion in sales due to counterfeit products in the year 2020 alone. Counterfeits industry is expected to suck 4.5 two trillion dollars from the global economy and it could endanger over five million legitimate jobs and also if the money aspect isn't enough it is also seen that the counterfeit business is a national security concern to countries because established counterfeit trade networks might be used by criminal groups involved in other illegal activities profits of counterfeits are known to fund criminal activity including attacks and things. the problem is where the money is going we are going to pretend we didn't hear that. So it gets a little messy, y'all. It gets a little messy. Now for act two, where is all this counterfeit makeup and products and hair care, et cetera, coming from? And how did this glue end up at my local beauty supply store? Just to note, cosmetics are some of the most counterfeited objects in the entire world and industry. Now, just to clarify, because some people might see the word cosmetics in this video and get alarmed and say, Brie, this is about a hair care product. But I would like to say that I also did my own research in advance to make sure and 
and the FDA does regard hair care as a cosmetic as it is some form of cosmetic enhancement and there are some uh, forms of hair care that also intersect that are both cosmetic and drug for example a medicated shampoo or even a sunscreen because it does have a medicated element to it so yes cosmetics does include hair care of every market in the world why this one what has caused this massive boom in the counterfeit cosmetics market? And that is, I thought would be a pretty simple answer, but I will start with the most obvious one, e-commerce and the rise of social media, believe it or not. <laughs> social media has impacted a lot of things on the global scale, y'all. She said she found her product cheaper online, but it turned out to be counterfeit. That is where sellers come in because sellers can create their own individual websites and they can sell directly to audiences and consumers without having to go past those marketplace guidelines that you might see on an Amazon or an AliExpress. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of counterfeits and things are able to sometimes slide through the cracks on those websites as well. Experts say the bulk of counterfeit products are sold online and at flea markets and they add to be familiar with what you're buying, always inspect the packaging and contents they at least have guidelines set in place where a store can get in trouble if reported and things like that and be taken down. And if a listing turns out to be a counterfeit, Amazon will suspend the account. In 2019, Amazon blocked 6 billion suspected bad listings on its site. Then Amazon's new counterfeit crimes unit takes over. Formed in 2020, the unit's made up of former FBI, Homeland Security agents, and federal prosecutors. But on these independent e-commerce sites, sometimes that gets a little bit trickier. On these independent websites, something that still shocks me is that these brands can actually use comprehensive, high-quality photos of these brands and products without getting them removed or taken down by the established marketplace like I said, like an Amazon, because they are sometimes a lot harder to catch for trademark and copyright violations that they may impose by stealing and or taking these pictures or using these official logos. For counterfeiting, offenders could face 10 years in prison. Compare that to, say, drug trafficking, where punishment can range from 20 years to life in prison, all the way up to a death sentence. And you might say, okay, Bree, so just stay away from these independent sites. But no, actually, marketplaces and social media sites are actually the most common place and breeding ground for a lot of these counterfeit products. Uh, marketplaces that have been listed like eBay, Amazon, Alibaba, AliExpress, etc., are areas where a lot of sellers will potentially create multiple profiles and accounts. Despite attempts and technologies, counterfeit cosmetics may still be found on these other marketplaces. And again, I'd like to highlight for legal reasons that these marketplaces a lot of times do have technologies and teams in place to fight counterfeits. But when you have such a large quantity of people using the sites, sometimes they're, they're finding new ways to evade the system every single day, which makes it that much harder. And also the use of third-party imagery to sell counterfeit products was actually confirmed by the US Government Accountability Office in 2018 due to one of their investigations. One of the most popular brands that we've seen is Urban Decay Cosmetics as investigated. Counterfeit cosmetics are also said to be dangerous on some of these marketplaces, including chemicals such as cyanide, mercury, rat droppings, and etc. according to that very same study. Whew. No ma'am. No ma'am. On other internet sites, fakes can be found. Social media began as a platform for sharing, but it quickly developed to include the ability to make direct transactions between everyday people. And as everything is now sold online, buying counterfeit goods is getting easier, but stopping them is much harder. You're cutting out the middleman of all of this and you're going directly to the source. And sometimes you don't know exactly what that source may be selling. Also through China, there are some really, really prominent messaging apps and things that are used where customers are buying things, not even going to the internet sometimes through these chat services such as WeChat and etc., where they're not even going to a marketplace to make a purchase. This is opening up a lot of vulnerability to customers that are you know, trusting they're getting a legitimate product. Shopping online wasn't always super, super duper common. I have this information right here in my notes. According to the Pew Research Center, only 22% of Americans reported making an online purchase in June of 2000, compared to a whopping 79% in December of 2016. That is a 16 year difference and a massive jump in percentile. The retail e-commerce industry, which generated 3.5 trillion in global sales in 2019, is expected to almost quadruple by 2020. 
2023. Now, this is where things get a little bit tricky and a little sticky is the fact that the rise of the very e-commerce industry has also been propelled by the counterfeit industry. You don't have to go to a flea market, local vendor to get a counterfeit. A lot of these vendors have moved into e-commerce and online, but they've also contributed to the boom of that very industry. So it's like you can't shut the entire industry down. And it's kind of like if you've ever watched, you know, documentaries about economics versus there are some people that they quite literally cannot stop because they're so impactful to the economy <laughs> that it's hard to cut everyone out. So that also creates an issue with the intersecting and interweaving of money and economy. So also the move to the e-commerce space made it increasingly difficult for customers, everyday people to spot counterfeits because when you are seeing things in person, sometimes, sometimes, if it's not the best replica, there are things that you can spot in the packaging that kind of gives it away. Here we have a Burberry coat and it says Burbelli mistakenly on the button. I will notice that the printing may be a little bit more dull or um, a little blurrier than the really, really sharp and high res version. And also now that we speak about intersection as well, the cosmetics industry has been regarded as a recession proof industry and it's constantly growing at a pace of about 3% per year. And so that means it kind of, it becomes the circle of life, right? Where you have these industries that are making massive amounts of products. We see so many launches coming out to keep up with social media where these brands are having to launch the biggest and best thing like every couple weeks or every month in order to stay relevant in the social media space and then on top of that it's giving counterfeiters more material to work with more things to potentially sell and replicate it just gets very messy from here y'all now on to the interesting part now we talked a lot about e-commerce and social media counterfeits but what about in-store counterfeits now who is the target audience for or consumer for an in-store counterfeit and the answer is simple people like me people who are impatient and want to get their hands on a product right now people who also work in fast-paced industries or need some something immediately that maybe even something as efficient as two-day shipping might not be able to cover. Now, this is the piece that my gut has told me this, but to see it in plain text and video, there was an investigative piece of journalism that I found from ABC Action News several years ago. I found out that there may even be moments that you go into a store and you get a product that is authentic, but it doesn't perform well because it's not quite counterfeited, but it's also not legit. Now you might be like, whoa, whoa, let me explain stay with me. Are you with me? Are you with me? Comment. I'm with you, Brie. But many salon brands do not actually, this is about salon hair care specifically, do not actually license their products to everyday chain stores. What? Oh. Are you getting what you actually pay for? when you purchase hair care products. Oh, at least one brand, in fact, says what's sold in big retail stores may not be what you think. Yes. Now, this was groundbreaking for me because I'm so used to seeing Paul Mitchell and Diva Curl and these big salon hair care name brands just in the grocery store and in certain stores. I'm not gonna name these stores specifically, but you guys can get the gist. John Paul DeJoria is the founder of Paul Mitchell Hair System. If you ever see Paul Mitchell in any drugstore or supermarket, Market. It is beyond any question of doubt, either counterfeit or from the black gray market. And I'm not saying any of these are fakes. It's actually quite the opposite. And here's why. Since a lot of these salon brands aren't actually selling their products or licensing them to be sold in these chain stores and establishments, sometimes these establishments, because they do want that clientele, they do want that consumer base, and they want to have the best products because that drives more people to shop with them, they get their products from third party distributors. Paul Mitchell says it has contracts with distributors that are only in the professional hair care industry. The distributors then sell the products to the salons. Somewhere in that chain, Paul Mitchell says a wholesaler gets involved and buys the product in what the company calls a backdoor deal. The product then ends up on shelves in retail stores where it should never be. That is where things get a little iffy. Third party distributors may be those people that you might see going through the salon. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I always used to see those people that would come 
come through the salon and try to take down the name and number of different hairdressers and they would be trying to sell them things but now it makes me just hypothesize and this is just me speculating here what if some of these were third-party distributors that were actually trying to utilize that hairdresser and their uh, you know cosmetology license in order to get them to buy products in bulk and sell to that third-party distributor they kind of hoard these products and then they go out and kind of do some <laughs> backdoor deals allegedly with these larger chain brands now now that shocked me. Now in this investigative piece, they said products may even cost more in stores than they do in salons due to the exchanges and many hands they have to go through to get to that shelf. There is usually one big difference and it might surprise you. It usually costs more in a drugstore or supermarket than it does in the professional salon. Breast Nahan says the products in the stores cost between 50 cents and $5 more. Action News did a quick check comparing one salon with one retail store and sure enough the Paul Mitchell Color Protect Daily costs 21 dollars and 89 cents at the salon and nearly a dollar more at the store some of the products may be even uh, expired or have been sitting in extreme conditions ruining the chemical makeup of the product itself we've seen this with stores such as you know your tj Maxx and marshall's really like hey stick to clothes when you go there don't get their makeup and hair products because a lot of them may be expired that might be one example and in this video paul mitchell tested and i'm going to insert a clip and in the salon or store you hope what you're getting is as advertised. Action News bought this Paul Mitchell shampoo from Target. We assumed, like this shopper, that it's the Paul Mitchell brand because it has a trademark on it and everything. It's either counterfeit, tampered with, or black market. Robert Crow means is the global artistic director for John Paul Mitchell Systems, commonly called Paul Mitchell. We don't sell to these outlets. We only sell to professional salons like mine and other salons around the world. But Action News found Paul Mitchell products in Target, CVS, and Walgreens. The fact of the matter is they're not buying direct from us. She points out a counterfeit case where the fake Paul Mitchell product had high levels of bacteria. And could that product have gotten into someone's eyes or a cut or something like that? An infection could have occurred. And they said even if a product is legitimate, it still runs the risk of being old. But those expired products can break down over time. The bottle on the left is from a salon, the right from a grocery store. You see white solid clumps as opposed to, in this case, you see definitely a much creamier consistency. If it's solidified like that, that now you're going to have those chunks of whatever that is in your hair. Now, as you saw in that video, that product that they tested from a local chain store had become crystallized because a lot of the water had actually evaporated. The textures were different. And I was explaining this to someone recently where they're like, why would that ruin your hair? And I said, because this is chemistry, right? This is that product that needs to be shelf stable. Number one, um, for everything to be chemically sound. I said, imagine you are supposed to be getting something and it's supposed to be salt water, but then imagine all of the water has dissolved and you're using nothing but fine, pure salt, sodium, right? So I said, imagine the friction that that would cause. And then they started getting the imagery. I'm like, yeah, if you have these products and they are no longer having the dilution that water can provide to dilute harsher substances, things that can be a little more detrimental, but work well when diluted, that can be a big mess, y'all. Old shampoo can acidify, making hair tangle and tear, and it can even carry bacteria. That's kind of like mixed drink versus a shot on your hair, right? You, you get the image, right? I think I explained that well i hope so but yeah when you're getting a concentrated or unbalanced or not stable version of a product it can be bad they've tested and found samples with bacteria mold oh thank you reputable brands tested by chemists can get a ton of backlash as well now we have to explore things y'all now this is where i might step on some toes including my own this means that and i'm not saying i'm not saying concrete that we have any of the answers for this this is another piece of speculation but that we have to be so diligent when we look at these products and especially when we get these instances of massive backlash for a product that was previously extremely reputable it begs the question 
could this potentially be a third party seller that has kept this product in just unstable conditions? Something where these third party conditions altered the formula to make it now detrimental to the hair, skin, scalp, and in general human body. And we can think about cases like the Diva Curl case, right? I looked at that class action lawsuit and that lawsuit actually went through y'all. I'm gonna put it here on screen, but that is one example where it begs the question, right? Now this is not discounting anybody with a Diva Curl story. I believe every single person's story because number one, why not? Number two, thank you for sharing and, and protecting everybody else. Number three, there's so much evidence and photos and videos and all sorts of things. And so the, the fact that something was wrong with that formula is not even up for debate, allegedly. The the why behind the, the instability or issues with the formula is something that made me a little bit curious after this example. And it even begs the question about, y'all ready? Y'all ready? I'm not ready. <laughs> my eco styler video that jar of eco styler i did get at a korean beauty supply store that was local and reputable near my home when i was on the east coast so that even begs the question because previous years as y'all have seen i didn't have any issues with that that product and so that's why it was so shocking and jarring to me and i was like yo like this should be concerning that this smells like ammonia Sm like i literally said my jar smelled like chemicals and there's so many people that were like mine doesn't it's fine but i'm like hey even if the brand specifically didn't mess their formula up, that doesn't mean that there's not something wrong. What's not clicking? What's not clicking? There's times when... This the fake. Look at this ingredients. This the real can. Look at the ingredient list. And then this look one's at this. shorter than this. Y'all out here buying fake product, black box market products. My students are going to make this go viral. Or something going on because regardless of what the brand did, what was going on in the world, what happened, my product still smelled like ammonia and made my eyes water. And people were like, maybe she just has an allergy. Like, you know, I got a lot of hate for that video and I really, really, really wanted to highlight. I'm looking at these ingredients and some things were a little like, hmm, okay. Better Business Bureau, I think I looked at and some other places Places where people had filed complaints against the brand, a lot of the complaints had similar similar notes as mine. So what if there was potentially a bad, corrupt, or counterfeit batch of these products that went out nationally? Can I lie? Can I get lied? That's where the brand also has to come in. And I think it's important to note, y'all, that I haven't used EcoStyler since then. I'm not saying I'll never use it again, right? The thing that has prevented me from using it at this point is not even the ingredients, because like I said, I'm pro clean beauty. I think that's one thing that's been very misconstrued. I even said it in my follow-up video. I am not like a binaries person as far as like you must use all clean products and, and green juice and because that doesn't even exist or just use all things that are terrible for you because I don't think anybody does well, I can't speak for anybody, but I don't think a lot of people do all horrible things for themselves. So in the chemical regard, my thing has been about informed consent of what you're using. Knowing that there's a carcinogen in something and saying, hey, it make my eyes look pretty. I'm using it today, but very sparingly. Like I just wanna know what's in the product in a clear, concise, and ethical way so I can make a choice as a consumer. And with my EcoStyler video, that was the message that got lost in all of it. I want people to question their products and demand that information and that clarity and that level of investigation so no one is sitting in their bathroom with their eyes watering from a hair gel like that is absurd right so that's got to get that out the way now on to act three it's hard to be cool when you're on your knees. now for act three this is going to be about the finesse and how to solve this or where we go from here. You know, I don't like doing videos nowadays where I don't leave y'all with anything. I don't wanna just complain and still fear and not give y'all tips. So I spent a more time than anything researching how to avoid this issue. Starting this, I'm gonna let y'all know, put y'all on game. And this part I wrote down how some beauty supply stores finesse. How did I get finessed 
with this bold hold. Now, one thing I found through actually watching the founder of Bold Holds video is she had a friend on FaceTime go into a reputable store. I'm assuming it was a friend or it could have been a supporter, colleague, and they found a store where it had been reported that there were fakes. And so she went and she grabbed a fake and they were looking on FaceTime at the numbers and everything like that. This is not the only change. We have another change in circulation. This change has been out for two years in circulation we did not make a big announcement about it we just basically kind of like talked to you guys about it but now that they will know about this they will copy this so to make sure that you're getting the actual product you want to look for that we also have other things other changes that we have made that we haven't made the announcement on if you have any issues, you need to contact us through our website. And they realized something, and this is what I think may have happened to me, potentially. Vendors will actually mix in fake products and real products so that they dupe both the consumer, me, and the brand owner. It, you did this for what? Why not? <laughs> Why? Why not? I look online and I see, oh, this is an established vendor that has an established relationship with the brand that's authorized to sell these and get shipment, then everything looks fine. And on the brand's end, everything looks fine. But then if you mix in some fake, then consumers might say, hey, maybe I just got a bad batch last time. Oh, it didn't break me out this time, but it did last time. And so everyone's in the dark or the store owners get to pocket whatever they have left over from the shipment. Now my favorite part, y'all. I went through hell and high water to find out how to not get a fake hair product. I am so powerful. My mind, oh, it amazes me sometimes. What is the first thing that I did as soon as I noticed that this product was fake and I decided that there's too much going on in the world to be talking about fake glue? <laughs> and I tabled this. I went on the Bold Hold website and I ordered a real glue. So here I have the fake and the real one. And I'm going to do a literal comparison close up and side by side so y'all know exactly how to spot a fake, specifically for this brand, but I'm gonna go into how you can do it for as many products as possible so nobody has this happen to them either. And I would like to confirm that as soon as I got this product, I looked at the bottom. I don't know if it'll show here, but I'll do a close up. It has to be engraved at the bottom. So I was like just holding it in, in shock and I was stunned. Buy it directly from the retailer online if you can or directly from the retailer in stores. These high price skin serums may look identical, but they're not. In the one to two days of me using the same product that I had used for months, I broke out in a very bad rash. She said she found her product cheaper online, but it turned out to be counterfeit. Maybe serious consequences to buying skin products outside of authorized dealers. Now the next thing might be just the packaging. This is uh, technically number one, packaging. High quality counterfeits may be almost identical spitting images, but in a lot of cases, there are some differences in the packaging. Seals and serial numbers are removed, and in this case, a product has been rewrapped. For example, on these bold hold glues, I noticed that the real one has an actual barcode and label and the fake does not. I didn't think anything of it at the store. Um, a lot of things don't have barcodes, which is also kind of a red flag. But yeah, the real has a barcode. Also, looking at the color of the package, the real glue actually has a, a slightly more vibrant color, whereas the fake, as you can kind of see on camera, looks a lot more pastel in the, in the pink. Like the real one definitely looks a lot more more um, opaque and then the because the one, real one is a little more opaque the font just seems clear all the colors seem a little bit bolder um, no pun intended and then even the instructions are quite literally in a bold easy to read font whereas the fake the instructions do appear a bit blurred and I would also like to point out the variable that I did use this glue for about a month before I realized that it was a fake had some wear and tear but now I'm at a place where both of these I haven't used this since I realized and this one I've used a ton and it has wear and tear as well but the packaging never faded to this color as you can see it's been over it's been like 
a year. So that is one thing to look for 100% is just any things that might be different. And shows how difficult it can be to tell the real thing from the fake. The lipstick on the left is counterfeit, the one on the right is real. Or alternative typefaces and fonts. The wrong hue or tint, like I said, is a big one. Look for errors and misspelling, which can happen with some brands. If you look carefully on some of them, they're misspelled because that's the easiest way well, right. to identify something that's counterfeit. Give son, S-O-N, not S-U-N. Another thing, especially online, is the cost. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. For example, like the Dyson hair dryers, right? If you see a Dyson hair dryer on Amazon for 50 bucks, knowing that's a $400 dryer, I would run. Unless you're intentionally buying a dupe, then that's one thing, but I would run the other way. There is a price tag attached to the low price. Do not waste your money. Might as well just say $50 eight times <laughs> that sounds wild this is the usual brand also another big thing is just using your senses the smell of the product for example a lot of brands have a signature scent uh if you smell a product and it smells a little bit off it might be time to go return that product if you can um because it may not be a fake specifically but it may just be old or now no longer shelf stable that's an issue uh with the government and cosmetics regulation cosmetics go unregulated so there aren't expiration dates i have to manually write down my expiration dates on my makeup and hair care so that i'm not accidentally using expired products which that just shouldn't happen i feel that cosmetics should have regulations as well to protect consumers uh, from this type of travesty. For four, an unauthorized merchant. Now, you can go on most brands' websites, and I'll hopefully include an overlay here. When you do like store locator or vendors on their website, it'll show you local stores that are authorized vendors of this product. So if you go to a store and you're like, wow, I didn't know they sold this here, they probably don't. They probably don't. Run away, run away fast. No, let, get out of there. Most of our clients are not interested in the sellers. They want to get to the distributors and the people that they're buying from. Well, sometimes brands don't update their websites, but I'd still just err on the side of caution. You're going to spend the money anyway. You might as well get what you paid for. Okay, period. Another big thing that I personally look at all the time is if that brand sells on Amazon, they'll have a link to their Amazon oftentimes on their website. So if you don't see that brand link their Amazon and you see the product on Amazon, be wary. And I will also try to include a screenshot on the screen of where you can find the seller info. A lot of the times I very much when I'm buying something that I want to be authentic, 100%, I will look at the seller. A lot of brands list their Amazon account in their listed places you can buy their products. So if you don't see that, run the other way. And some sellers are really, really sneaky y'all. They'll name their shop name after the brand that they have the most counterfeits of, but there will be something different. Whereas they're like in all caps with an extra L or an extra letter. Now, number five is verifying the product details you know product serial numbers are frequently absent on counterfeits like i showed y'all here the barcode is missing the serial numbers are gone there is no engraved b at the bottom if they do exist the product numbers may differ from the packaging numbers so sometimes there are apps and websites out there where you can actually scan a product's barcode and in that case also just buying at established uh, like department stores and for salon hair care brands, make sure you are buying them specifically from a salon. Or if the brand does sell online, a lot of times they do not, get it directly from their website. And this means that for some of us, if the salon is sold out or something, we cannot let impatience guide us because our impatience will make us spend money on things that do not work. Or maybe it is a legitimate dupe and it works exactly the same, but do you really want to risk rat droppings? In your, I, I, I can't. I, hey, I'm not knocking nobody's hustle, but I can't do. I cannot do the red droppings. I cannot do it. I promise. I cannot do it. I'm sorry. I can't. Another red flag that people might not think about. Number six is if the product is labeled as limited edition. For example, two ways. It can be a popular product that's not limited edition labeled as such. That means that seller might be setting up to sell something at a super discounted price, and then they're gonna take the shop down as soon as they sell out, and either people will never get those products, or they'll be getting all counterfeits. Or there is a product that you've never seen before from this brand, hypothetically. 
speaking, let's say, Make It Forever is releasing this Christmas palette. You don't see any mention of said palette anywhere else. That is to lure in people to think they're getting something exclusive when really it's an easier way to make something even more fake because you have nothing to compare it to since it's labeled as limited edition. Another good thing to do is get testers. Try items in stores and established retailers first before you buy them. That way, even having testers on hand, I'd be saying get like two to three. Also look for red flags. Red flags might include the aforementioned signs that I had listed, as well as other information. Look for fake reviews. Be identified by seeing a large number of good reviews in a short, very short period of time. I like to change reviews up on like Amazon and stuff from like a uh, newest to oldest. And sometimes I'll see the newest reviews all say, oh, this is a scam. This product's terrible, etc." But the product has 1500 positive reviews. So that's another really good way to protect yourself. A lot of short term reviews with identical phrasing, etc. Long shipment time. If it's a product that's supposed to be from a local retailer, that means that there might be some form of drop shipping. <laughs> you know, that's been a phenomena recently. Drop shipping is when a retailer advertises as a local re retailer, but then the product is still being shipped from China or Alibaba or um, some type of manufacturer overseas to be a replica or uh, made on site. Also, again, with using your senses, check the consistency of your products. Say in this day and age, now that I'm like getting older and stuff, I used to be all like, oh, I'll just take the food even if it's kind of off. Or I used to be very much a uh, people who's in that regard, but y'all, I'm not the one. I will send an email to a brand. I will DM them. I will slide in those DMs like, what is this? What is going on? What's happening here? And that is it. Also reporting your fakes. I know that Bold Hold specifically has a place on their website where you can report fake products and the location that you found them. And that way the person can retract the vendor status of that person if they are mixing products or they can completely just warn people and add it to a list of vendors that are selling fakes so you don't support that shop in general anymore. And counterfeiters are getting creative and making their products seem legitimate. From creating fake Amazon listings to flooding the U.S. trademark office with phony applications. I don't feel like we should be supporting shops that sell known counterfeits, especially of black owned brands. Like that's the piece that was beyond me. I said, not you selling fakes of black owned brands so the actual black owned brand doesn't get any of that black owned money, okay? Whew, child. And this is one of my final tips is <laughs> when you have a product that you love, that is like your, your favorite product that you use all the time, keep the original packaging before you buy a replacement and don't throw it away, then go get a replacement. Um, bring that replacement home so you can compare the two. This actually did happen to me again during the pandemic with some Vaseline, y'all. Would not believe I saw a great deal on some of that Vaseline body oil, like, you know, the little oil gel they have. And I was like, oh, this looks good. Y'all, I kept the original Vaseline packaging and I said, ah. I got it and immediately I said the consistency was different and I had got it off Amazon and guess what y'all, I shipped it right back and I filed a complaint because I was like, what the heck, this is clearly not the same. Right, y'all so this concludes my video today and this is all I have for you now I will be digging into this topic for as long as I can if I find any new information and y'all want a follow-up video I will hundred percent do a follow-up I'm very passionate about this topic I feel like the research is never truly done I will be listing a lot of my resources that I used down in the description box below so that y'all can see if you want to do any further reading up on this topic as well and y'all I'm just shook I'm shook all about it uh, literally, again, I've been buying directly from brands, especially black owned brands, as much as possible. And just bearing with the shipping time, you know, um, also small businesses sometimes do have a longer shipping time. And just being patient, ordering things earlier. So I keep now a list on my fridge and reminders in my phone when something is running low. So that I do give it like a week or two, um, especially if it's something that is harder to get my hands on, like a product that is from an independent retailer. I'll order it in advance 
months so that way just anticipating it running out i know not everybody can do that but y'all the quality of my life has changed since i've been making sure that all my products are from legitimate retailers talented brilliant incredible amazing show-stopping spectacular never the same totally unique completely not ever been done before so let me know if this video was interesting to y'all if y'all want me to do some more investigative journalism slash uh, deep dives or video essays this type of content is fun for me i love to talk i love to explore things i'm nosy so this is the perfect genre for me y'all i'll bring my nosy self all up in these topics if y'all want and comment below if y'all have ever gotten a fake and where it was from how you knew and what you learned from that and how people can avoid it save us all <laughs> save us from getting these fakes because i'm trying to avoid this as much as possible it's just the pain in the butt having to return things or feeling like you wasted your money or feeling kind of like duped and betrayed as a consumer so unfortunately a lot of these brands do hire departments to do this work but us as the consumers have that one-on-one -on -one experience and there are way more of us than there are departments to spot fakes so if we go directly to brands and let them know there are fakes then we can do a lot more help and service to our fellow consumers in order to make sure that they get off the marketplace and yeah and also another good place to check is reddit and forums i found a lot of good information about which beauty supply stores are reputable and in my area, as well as other areas, a lot of black owned beauty supplies exist. I trust them with my whole soul. Again, y'all, I could talk about this forever, but I love you. Peace out, gang gang. Please don't forget to subscribe. Oh, I'm gonna do that anyway. And let's get to a million. I am, I am committed to a million subscribers, y'all. I don't care how long it takes, but I am ready. But that's neither here nor there. Make sure you subscribe, comment below so you can help out the gang so we don't have to suffer through these fakes anymore as much as possible and give this video a thumbs up. It really, really helps my channel. It's free. This video took almost <laughs> a year of just trying things and finding tips and research. So, you know, five seconds for a like would be so, so helpful in exchange for all this work, please. Thank you. Love you. All right, bye. That's it for me.